I broke down crying about the acolyte tonight. I'd been grieving privately for days, and I needed to let it all out. The show means more to me than words can say. It made me feel seen as a female Star Wars fan, and as a woman who was taught by society to hide her rage. Forget Seneca Falls, the suffragettes, and a multi-generational narrative of feminist emancipation. The decision not to renew a space fantasy show because of terrible viewer figures is the most egregious resting away of hard-fought dignity and visibility. A show through which the barely contained tumult of marginalization could be abided through. The show was ruined by a Caucasian cultural mafia executing a cold-blooded hit. Apparently, the toxic Dubros are out there celebrating their toxicity. Yay, we did it, you guys! The Acolyte was cancelled because it was the lowest viewed show on Disney+, Plus, and it cost a fortune. The last thing in the world you want is to be mansplained to. I don't want to be a mansplainer in chief, but this is like a red rag to a mansplaining bull. You're essentially shunting me onto center stage and making urgent prompting gestures and mouthing mansplain from the wings. Well, basically you start by asking, what was wrong with the show? Everything! The Mary Sue, over the course of 24 hours, published not one, not two, not three, but four articles expressing their exasperation about the cancelling of the Acolyte. And when that happens, well, you've got to reach for the remote control, turn off the TV, twitch your white string vest, light up a cigarette, look into an ironic conjectural middle distance, eyes narrowing in the wreath of smoke and impending patriarchal duty, get out of the paisley print armchair and expound on some home truths. So I guess I'll just indulge myself and mansplain the hell out of this, riding a wave of testosterone and buoyed up with machismo, and teeming to the brim and spilling over with chauvinism. If a show isn't someone's cup of tea, that doesn't mean they are a dubro or a misogynist. If a show doesn't float your boat, that doesn't mean that boat is adrift in a sea of latent bigotry and insecurity. Entertainment is a marketplace, with products vying for attention, and with consumers having limited time and limited disposable income, Making a choice to consume something better is not an overt dismissal or disparagement of the lesser product, but foremost an affirmation of the better product. There is no onus on anyone to watch a show in a spirit of supporting it, even if it doesn't overtly appeal to them, because there's some wider, abstract, progressive notions we want to encourage. The idea that there is some sort of onus upon a demographic of males, or even white males, to set aside any misgivings they might have about a show, and the interests of supporting something for the wider betterment in a socio-cultural sense is flaky and weak. You like something or you don't, and it's actually a little obnoxious to impose a refusal to evolve or support empowerment or any other motivations or impulses into the decision-making of consumers who don't think a product is very good, and they would rather watch something else. Trying to appeal with something indulgent and in many ways willfully alienating to the majority of viewers and devotees in a fanbase, and then whinging and whining and apportioning blame to anything other than the quality of the show, the indulgence of the show, and the de-emphasizing consciously of that wider fanbase, well, no one will end up watching. Whilst I'm in the midst of this socio-cultural bacchanal of mansplaining, I should also impart that many of the people online despairing over the snubbing of the acolyte aren't men, and whilst it's not especially gracious or charming to mansplain, it's kind of warranted in terms of gender when assumptions are being imposed upon you, and when people who don't have willies and chest hair and that have formed socio-cultural designs on defining what constitutes your gender in its ideal form, on your behest, unsolicited. For the most part, the male characters in the show were just not relatable or cool or even especially recognizable to the overwhelming majority of mainstream men. Not dude bros, just guys. Manny Jacinto, and to a certain extent Lee Jung Jae, were interesting enough and at times fairly compelling. But practically all the other males, from Yord to this bizarre, passive, ethereal soy boy, were weird constructions out of the mind of someone who doesn't really get men all that much. Most men just don't act in such a jittery, histrionic way, or in ways that are interchangeable and indistinguishable with female counterparts, and who, for the most part, seem ancillary, or do not have particularly a great amount of agency. I would say that most, if not all, the women bemoaning the dude bros for their conspiratorial review bombing and meanness, will have read a novel written by a man, and found the female characters written by that male author to be a little off. Not quite authentic in the mannerisms, or ironies, or proclivities, or forms of speech, or behavior. 
So why is it so impossible or impermissible for these same people to think that the door couldn't swing both ways? That guys could see male characters on screen, written by Leslie Headland, and feel that those male characters are a little off, not quite authentic, not quite recognizable, and therefore not especially appealing. It's a sanctimonious blind spot they have. Also, there's no onus on guys, or anyone in particular, to buy into the aesthetic you've conjured up, nor to accept the stretching of the aesthetic of Star Wars, whatever that is anymore, beyond certain boundaries. There's no onus on guys, or the wider audience, to just roll with it. No one watching any show, or any franchise they love, seeing vast and unappealing changes, should have to check themselves, or challenge their assumptions in real time while they're watching the content, especially if that content is co-opted and repurposed from something established and beloved, rather than riskily and creatively invented out of nothing. Star Wars has always had romantic elements, both in the sense of romance between love interests, but also the wider sense of romance of a traditional hero's journey. But modern ideas, the intricate, almost encyclopedic notions of sexual and gender coding, both on-screen and off-screen, and the overemphasis of these kind of elements at the expense of plot momentum, at the expense of wider psychological impasses and tensions, is surely interesting to a certain niche in the culture, but the wider culture, including mainstream men who make up a large share, perhaps even the lion's share of the fan base for this franchise, don't especially find it enlightening, hip, overly sophisticated, overly dramatic, or overly compelling, and in fact, see it as quite indulgent, a little bit prissy, and with a sense of the writer and her team thinking progressivism infused into the screenwriting is audacious, bold, refreshing, and exciting. Whereas much of the fan base, already quite familiar with the dozens of cultural icons who pushed such boundaries decades before, when it was actually interesting, don't see this stuff as particularly audacious at all, but rather as the writers socio-culturally preening. I think people, on balance, don't really care about the travails of lesbian space witches, queer-coded strangers, soy boy Jedi adjutants, and tedious twins played by a non-binary actress, directed by a lesbian director whose wife is also in the cast. The show failed because it wasn't a very high-quality show, and no one watched. Lastly, let's get into the nitty-gritty of this whole, oh, so you're just angry that every Star Wars show doesn't have a white male lead argument. Well, let's go through the flicks. Disney's put out five feature films of Star Wars, three of which are helmed by a strong female character, with two support male characters, one being African-American, the other part Guatemalan. Outside of that, you've got two films, Rogue One, helmed by a strong female character, and a male hero who is of Mexican heritage. And lastly, you've got Solo, A Star Wars Story, which is actually helmed by a white male, but in a film with the least amount of budget and marketing, and one which performed the worst and was placed in the most vulnerable part of the release slate. In the Disney Plus streaming shows, you had The Mandalorian, helmed by Pedro Pascal, who was Chilean, you have The Book of Boba Fett, helmed by Timuera Morrison, who was Maori, and you have Andor, helmed by Diego Luna, who was Mexican, and you have Ahsoka, helmed by a strong female character, who was also African-American, with two co-lead heroes. One is a strong female character general, and the other is a strong female character budding Jedi. And then lastly, you have Kenobi, where we have a white male lead, but an existing character in his 50s. And we are to be treated to yet another Rey film, helmed by a strong female character, and a feature film centered around the Mandalorian, again played by Pedro Pascal. So that's two out of twelve products with a white male lead. And in terms of a new white male lead, the tally is zero out of twelve. In seven films, there have been no male Jedi lead. So this argument that sprung up along the lines of not every Star Wars show has to have a white male lead it's perhaps the biggest blind spot of all, and it's actually very strange, and suggests a lack of self-awareness from an embittered and somewhat histrionic group of acolyte devotees. Now, listen, team. Was it a little pleasurable to mansplain for a bit? Absolutely. In fact, it's going to take a concerted psychological exertion of will to try and cajole that Gavroche genie back into the bottle. But sometimes you've got to purse your lips, be deaf to protest, stand up straight, straighten your tie, and put a bit of stick about. Mm.